Welcome to April's edition of Random Stuff. There's quite a lot in this one, so I'm going to start with the comment positivity section. It's time for the comment positivity section, where I'm just going to pick out a few comments that either asked interesting questions or perhaps uplifted me in some way. So, reading glasses on, and we'll begin. So first off, thank you to everyone who wished me well in the video where I obviously wasn't very well. I made a not lasagna and a bit of low effort cooking. Uh, thank you very much to everyone who wished me get well soon. I did actually sound a lot worse than I was in that video. Whenever I get a cold, it always goes straight to my throat and I go through the phases of kind of like Orson Welles, fake Morgan Freeman, Barry White, Ray Winston, before I eventually get better. It's always worse than it sounds, but thank you anyway for wishing me well. A couple of people said thank you very much for the scrambled eggs recipe in the April Fool's video. The scrambled eggs recipe was real, and it is my favourite way to make scrambled eggs because it, it just ends up tasting really good and it doesn't go all rubbery. Obviously I don't take the credit for that because that was something I got from uh, Raymond Blanc. On the subject of eggs, a couple of people said my fried egg in the lava bread video looked really good and asked how do I get a fried egg that has a runny yolk but the white is fully cooked. Well, again, I don't think I probably invented this, although I did discover this one for myself. Let's go and have a look. So this is going to be a fried egg sandwich. I've got my cast iron skillet. You can do this in a nonstick pan, but I'm just going to use this today. I've got my bread buttered and ready. I've got Marmite on one slice because that's going to be my salt and seasoning. I've got a lid. This is not the lid for this pan. There isn't a lid for this pan but this one just happens to fit rather well. Just a lid off one of my other saucepans, and I've got about a tablespoonful of water. So into the pan, a little bit of olive oil, a little bit of butter, and this isn't anything to do with butter burning or anything, this is just actually that olive oil and butter are nice flavors, and that's gonna go on full. Also, the advantage of using butter here is that I will know when things are up to temperature because the butter will start to foam. Okay, and that butter is now starting to foam, which is a good indicator that things are warm enough for us to add, add the eggs. You can see how fresh that egg is. The white is kind of standing up. So two eggs. I'm just gonna keep going on full blast, frying these. Now my cooker is slightly on a slant here, so we've gotta fix that. So I'm just gonna turn the pan around just to even things out a little bit. It's gonna start spitting and I'm just going to stand back. And this spitting and bubbling, although it's a bit messy, you're really not going to get the frilly brown filigree on the edge of the white without that. Okay, so once I can see a layer of white fully cooked in there, pan lid on standby, in with the water and on with the lid. dangerous if you don't have the pan lid ready. But now the steam is cooking the top of that egg, just cooking the white on top. And now we can turn the heat completely off and it will just cook in the residual heat of the pan. And spitting has more or less stopped now, so there we go. So I suppose that actually includes a little bit of poaching. But there we go, we've got two fried eggs. It's probably a little bit more water than we really actually needed that time. Let's get those onto the waiting bread. So there we go, that's fried eggs with a nice runny yolk, but no undercooked white. A few chilli flakes on there, because why not? And that's a fried egg sandwich. Just cut through that so you can see what it's like inside. And here's what a fried egg sandwich should do when you bite into it. Terribly messy, but really delicious. Now, of course, not everybody likes eggs with runny yolks, but if you do, that's one way of doing it. Next one's actually quite interesting. So this was on a scan baiting video. How long does the editing usually take on a video like this? So my rule of thumb for video editing is that one minute of final video runtime equates to, on average, one hour of work in recording and production. Some videos are a lot less effort than that. So for example, the video where I went and did a slow TV walk on Seatown Beach, 
That one was just a case of me walking along the beach, recording footage, almost unedited, although I did have to go and watch it through probably twice in the edit uh, before I uploaded it. So that one was really simple. At the other end of the scale, the scan baiting videos perhaps have sometimes as much as 100 to 1 ratio, so 100 minutes effort for every one minute of screen time. That might sound like a ridiculous exaggeration, but I've written down a breakdown of what that comprises. So obviously the scan baiting itself, so you've got reading emails, replying to emails, and then organizing all of those conversations. Grabbing all of the screenshots, so I have to take screenshots of every piece of every email conversation, and then I have to sanitize them for email addresses and contact phone numbers and things, and my own email address as well. The reason I censor the scammers' email addresses and phone numbers is YouTube policy. I think probably, even though those people are scammers, YouTube policy is not going to care very much about that. So my videos could end up getting taken down, even though those are scammer contact details, because the the policy process doesn't care and can't verify that. Anyway, I digress. Also effort writing, recording and cutting the audio script, then editing and animating the video. And even for the fairly simple style of scan baiting video where it's just emails flying onto the screen and then stacking up at the top, there, each one of those screenshots has to be keyframed manually because they're all different sizes and shapes and they're all there for a different amount of time depending on how much I waffle. So each one of those screenshots needs to be animated in and out and managed individually. And then obviously the process of editing any video entails kind of watching and re-watching all of the cuts and edits over and over again until you get it right. So you have to watch a transition, you have to watch it in real time, and if it's not right you have to adjust it and then watch it again. And so all of that watching and re-watching as part of the edit process all stacks up the time. So yeah, for the scan baiting videos, it's not unusual for a 30 minute scan baiting video to have taken maybe 50 hours of work. And that's part of the reason why I don't just make scan baiting videos. Not just because the other ones are easier work, but because some of the things that I do in the other videos aren't really actually work at all. They're leisure. You know, foraging, going for a walk, cooking. These are all leisure activities to me. So I get to do a little bit of leisure but also transform it with a bit of extra work into actual productive work. I always get lots of lovely comments from people saying about my videos are calming and help them to feel calm or help them sleep actually, which I really love those comments. So I've got a couple of recommendations for people that like the calm vibe. The first one is mudlarking with kit and caboodlers. So mudlarking as in digging around, often on seashores for treasures such as old bottles and clay pipes, and their videos have got some lovely cut scenes of nature and they're just calm and genuine and also for me infectiously joyous. I guess not everyone is necessarily going to find it charming and engaging to watch people literally almost move to tears by finding a glass bead or a china figurine but I certainly do. So if you like videos with a bit of nature and that are really generally calming and lovely and friendly give that channel a look. And the other one is Florian Gadsby. I stumbled across his channel when I was researching for my Wild Clay series. His content is kind of the other end of the spectrum from my amateur fumblings with clay that I just dug out of the ground. He's making unique pottery with incredible art and scientific precision. But the thing I like most about his content is that it's incredibly calm and thoughtful. Not only giving deep insight into his processes, but also each video is almost like a tutorial on mindfulness and practicality. So I don't just learn about pottery from Florian. I learn about how to think. A few quick questions on the back of my video about Wish.com. People asked, have I tried Temu, or Temu, or Timu, or whatever it's called. Uh, I had a look at it, and it doesn't look as scammy on the surface as Wish. So I couldn't find any flash storage devices which made ridiculously fraudulent claims about their capacity. Same thing for power banks. I couldn't find any obvious, ridiculously fraudulent scams. That's not to say there aren't scams on there. I couldn't test the site beyond that because they don't ship to the UK. And then finally, for this comment positivity section, would love to see what you're up to in that new garden of yours this spring if you feel like doing a garden video. Well, you're in luck. There's been quite a lot going on in the garden. It's continued to be really wonderful to watch and discover the existing plants and flowers all coming to life. We're still holding back from making too many major changes in this garden, certainly in places where the plants haven't fully woken up yet because we don't want to destroy what's already here. We would like to actually understand what we've got before we decide about making any changes. 
In other places we have made a few little changes, so I've planted a few things and we're going to have a look at that now. So here's a random assortment of what else has been happening in the garden and then after that's a couple of pieces of a kind of random technical project which is unfinished at the moment but I might revisit later. Okay, I'm in the downstairs greenhouse today and I'm going to plant some seeds. I've got lots of tomatoes to plant. I bought this pack of mixed tomatoes and then I got another pack of mixed tomatoes as a free gift from a, a different seed purchase. I've also got some globe artichokes to plant and peppers, chilli peppers. So let's start with the chilies. And I think we'll find, I think probably, how many chilli plants do I really want? I'll plant one module, I think, probably 12 plants. Let's see how many seeds I've got, I suppose. That might be the limiting factor. Okay, one. Wow, there's not many seeds in there. Might be just enough to do this whole tray with one spare. Uh, we'll put two in that pot there. Oh, and I get a free label with that one, that's good. So I'm just going to push those down a little bit into the compost. They don't need to go very far down. Okay, so that's just pushing them down a little bit. Generally speaking, seeds need to be buried at twice their own depth in the soil, so that's not very far down for a little seed like these. Right, so I'll water those in a minute. This one I think will have artichokes and maybe something else. They look a lot like peeled sunflower seeds, don't they? And that's because they are in the same family. They're daisy family, so they're related to sunflowers. And that's why I suppose they look like a bit like sunflower seeds. Okay, just again cover those over. Just remember for the moment they're on the right hand side and I've got some seeds left. You can plant these directly outdoors so I might have a go with that as well. Tomatoes are going to go in this slightly larger one which I can't even get all of it on the screen here on, on the video but so this is a kind of windowsill propagator. It has these little modules that go into it so at the bottom bit catches any water that might run through so I think in here let's have a look and see I don't know if we've got separate packets inside here looks like maybe we have the varieties we've got are Golden Oconigan, Gardener's Delight, Marmond, Tigerella and Moneymaker so popular varieties of uh, tomato very well known varieties most of those Moneymaker, Gardener's Delight are oh rather standard varieties yes so they're all in separate packets that's good and they've all got little tags to go with them so i think what we'll do well i know marmande because it's a big cooking tomato a big sort of ruffled cooking tomato i want more of those probably than other things so i think i'll probably plant them in the other side of the next to the artichokes so I'll get six plants of ideally six plants of marmande so tiny little seeds there they are so we'll have those in this one here and before I forget the tag, cover them up a little bit. Not much, because again, they're tiny little seeds. They don't want to be too too much covered. Wow, traffic's a bit of a thing today. Okay, so that's that. Moneymaker and Gardener's Delight are your standard kind of red round tomatoes. Interesting how the seeds are a little bit different for each one. I suppose some of that's because you know, some of these are more more of a cherry tomato than others. Okay, that's the four. And Tigerella. That's the stripy one. Right, now these Tombola tomato seeds, what they mean by Tombola is not one variety, it's just a mixture, kind of potluck. So it's like a lucky dip. 
and you can actually see there's all different sorts in there. So I think for this one, we nearly lost them. I will carefully tip out all of the seeds and I'm going to try and pick four seeds that look different from each other because that kind of seems like the best way to get maximum variety. So there's a couple of these seeds are quite dark coloured which could be those black tomatoes. So we'll have one of those. We'll have that really big one. We'll have that really pointy one. And we'll have that really little one. And then these are not going to stay out here in the greenhouse because it's still a little bit cold at night. So these will probably go on a windowsill indoors. That's probably enough. Right, so now lids can go on. And I'm not going to leave these out here in the greenhouse. It gets a little bit too cold at night, so these will go indoors for now. Right, it is time to plant out my potatoes. So we've got uh, three different varieties here. I think this is Nicola, King Edward, and Pink Fur Apple. And then these are the blue potatoes I bought in M&S, which have also started to chit. So they're going to get planted out today. They're going to go in this plot here, which has got uh, some well-rotted manure and seaweed on it and I did put that straight on top of the weeds and all I'm going to do is just go over with the hoe and just chop off the tops of the weeds like this and that's how we're going to manage the weeds here not going to bother trying to dig things right out just keep on hoeing away at the unwelcome things and eventually you know those things will not do so well. Like there's a dandelion there, probably quite a taproot on it, but we'll just chop off the leaves. And if we keep on doing that, eventually they have to give up. You know, if you keep on depriving the plant of its ability to make food, it will stop living. You can hear the rooks up in the, up in the oak tree up there. We've got a rookery up in the oak tree. This pile of sticks here in the woodshed is all sticks that the rooks have brought into the tree and then dropped into the garden and so just had me wondering can we train rooks to bring me firewood one other thing to show you here as well behind the greenhouse here this is cornus mass cornelian cherry which is a tree with edible fruits so looking forward to trying those i've always wanted to try cornelian cherries and looks like i'm going to get a chance to if the birds don't get there first so potatoes are here Trenches are kind of ready and we'll have, I think we'll have pink fur apple this end. So we'll put them there. Space them out maybe, well I need to leave enough space that I can dig up the whole of this plant without disturbing the next one. So I reckon that's about, yeah about 18 inches. So the other one goes there. Then we can have the blue potatoes. Well, I might plant them in a little row here, actually. I'll have the blue potatoes over here, like this. And I will put them a bit closer together because they're smaller. Like that. Nicola can go up here, around about there. And there. And then King Edward in that side. Like this. Okay, yeah, that's about right. Yeah. Yep, so I think we ought to just put a cane across here so we can mark where the end of the potatoes are. Yeah. And then if I just put the spade there for now. So that's that's where the end of the potatoes are gonna be. And then it's just a case of covering back over. Like this. Even my other way. That's right, they'll find their way. And then we'll have to have some netting on there, or else you're gonna go and dig them all up, aren't you? Uh, 
and in a few days or weeks we should see some shoots coming up and there's more soil here at the edge to kind of earth up onto them as they grow there we go so that's the potatoes in now leeks up this end which we've bought ready grown and with leeks all you have to do is just make a hole like that with a dibber in this case a stick and we just drop the leek in there like that make sure all the roots are in and we don't press that down we just water that in we just drop them in yeah nice one Eva Not very much of the plant sticking up here, but that's fine because as long as there's a little bit, it'll sprout up. The depth that you plant them to here is critical because the deeper you can go, the more white part of the leek you'll end up with. So this whole bed here is basically leek and potato soup in the making. You just kind of puddle them in like that because digging them in could damage them and you end up with kind of wonky or split or crooked leaks. So you just fill up each hole with water and let the soil kind of wash back into place. That's it. And then to keep the dog off, yeah, you're the dog, um, and next door's cat, we've got these metal hoops, which the previous owners of the house left for us. And we're just going to put some netting over there just to, just to protect everything from... Uh, getting dug up and disturbed while it's growing. Just here at the end of the retaining wall between the uh, downstairs greenhouse and the upstairs greenhouse, I'm gonna plant this. It's a honeyberry. It's a kind of honeysuckle that has edible fruits. I have a feeling you need more than one variety of this for it to fruit, but I'm gonna plant one and get it established here. Oh, so it's a little bit deeper and bigger than the pot I'm planting in there and I'm going to put a little bit of compost in there to help it along. This compost has uh, got co rotted wool in it, which has got loads and loads of lovely nutrients for plants. You wouldn't know that was wool to look at it. I think it must be mixed with composted bark or something else. So we'll have a nice little layer of that in the bottom of the hole. So as you can see, it was definitely ready to be planted out. And I'll just tease out some of those roots. I don't think it really matters all that much. I think it's pretty much a myth. The idea that these roots need any help spreading out. I think they'll just do that naturally. Okay, that's in. We'll keep the level of the pot, the pot compost level with the surface of the soil. And then just fill that back in. And I have only just noticed, this has got some flowers on it. Not really very showy flowers, but apparently they are quite fragrant. Yep. So quite uh, scented, sweet flowers. Okay, well, I will give that a good puddle in with some water, just to make sure that the roots are established and all of the loose soil around the edges is washed down into the hole. And then we'll leave it and get that established. As I say, I think I might need to get another one of the same species, different variety, so that I can uh, so they can cross pollinate. But we'll see. Just found one little bit of treasure in the garden while we were digging. A bit of an old medicine bottle, California fig syrup. It's a shame it's broken, but there we go. That's what that is. Just walking along the path here, and we saw this little chap. Thought it was a caterpillar at first. I'm going to get in closer with the camera that focuses close because that is no caterpillar. This is a glowworm. This is an insect that produces flashes of light from its abdomen by mixing chemicals. And it's here on the path. So I'm going to move it onto the grass over there just so that it doesn't get squished. But there we go, glowworm. First time I've seen one during the daytime. Just down here, that's a small tortoise shell butterfly. Oh, it's letting me get quite close. We saw some peacock butterflies earlier, but they wouldn't let me get nearly as close as this. Uh, 
that's a peacock butterfly that I think has been hibernating inside this old badger hole, or this old badger set. That's really interesting. That means the one that lives in our shed is probably thinking about coming out about now. There's another one on the edge of the hole there. I don't know if you can see it, it's got its wings closed. But that's obviously a kind of hibernation spot for peacocks down there. That's interesting, isn't it? So I suppose the thing to do will be to check if our guest has checked out yet. Nope, still there. Okay, although it has moved. It's obviously getting ready to go. I won't do anything with this shed, even though it's uh, falling apart. I won't do anything with this shed until such time as that butterfly has <laughs> departed. I know that sounds like a silly thing, but it's been in here all winter. The butterfly's been really patient. I think I should at least match that patience and wait for it to fly before we demolish this shed. In case you're wondering if the butterfly might get stuck in there, it won't. That's the limit to which this door closes, just because the shed's warped and falling apart. Right, well it's been a lovely warm day today, lovely warm spring day, and we've got rain and storms. Sorry about that dog. We've got rain and storms forecast for the rest of the week. So I left the shed door open all day today in the hope that the warm air and sunshine might encourage our guest to fly while the weather is good. Let's have a look. Yes, it's gone. So our peacock butterfly guest has checked out which means I can chop up the rest of these little bits of firewood now and then we can demolish this shed which frankly is going to demolish itself if we don't do that my pennywort seedlings have actually almost outgrown their tray you can see all the ones around the edge died off and that is because this lid has not all that effective but never mind I have hundreds of seedlings here it's time to prick them out and put them in individual pots I don't actually have enough individual pots and I'm going to use these tiny modules because this will hopefully give me a little root ball that I can push into crevices in walls what I need is a tool with which I can just dig up a few of these they haven't got very much in the way of roots at the moment but it is going to be very much a case of teasing out that's more or less one I think there might be two plants there and we'll just drop that into its position in that module and we'll water those in in a minute so you can see each of these plants has got Eva be quiet each of these plants has got some of its kind of adult form leaves now which is they're like little umbrellas and they've got the little navel in the middle of them. I'm actually trying to try not to handle the roots too much. We'll handle them by the leaves and just push the roots carefully down like that. We are going to have way too many plants here. But what I'll probably do after I've transplanted these is I'll have to harden them off so that they can go outside which means basically acclimatizing them to the outside world so they'll go outside during the day come back in under cover overnight for a few nights until they kind of toughen up a little bit and get used to the idea of being outside once they get to that point then I can plant them out I think it's a reasonably hardy plant but any plant can suffer shock if it goes from an indoor environment directly to cold outdoors without a period of adjustment. Just goes to show you how tiny those little dust-like seeds really were because I've got hundreds and hundreds of plants and they're all kind of interlocked at the root. I don't want to disturb them too much but also there's not much point in me planting a great clump of these things in each of the pots or else they'll still be competing with one another for nutrients and resources and space but also I might as well pick the kind of healthier specimens the more robust and better grown specimens right camera off because it's kind of in the way and back in a moment all right well Hopefully, 
A few of them will survive this rather brutal treatment. They are quite fragile little plants. They're quite succulent and the, the stems are quite brittle. So I imagine I may have done some injury to some of them in this process, but time will tell. Hopefully we'll end up with a few living plants, a few survivors that I can plant out in the garden. I think once they're out in the garden, in the walls, they'll hopefully establish a self-sustaining population out there. It is the right kind of environment for them and climate. So all I've got to really do is get them past the seedling stage and hopefully they'll take it from there. So these are all going to go out in the downstairs greenhouse to grow on. I've got still way more than half of my original seed tray left. So I'll give that a water as well. So that's my backup basically if these transplanted ones don't take. So that's the pennywort and I'm hoping to be able to harvest some of this for the table this year because if these plants make good growth then we could be harvesting and eating some of this because it's an edible wild plant kind of texture of cucumber but I'm hoping without the flavor of cucumber because I can't eat cucumbers I don't recall how close the flavor is to cucumber but just late in life I suddenly acquired an aversion to the flavor of cucumber so I'm hoping this will be a good substitute for cucumber in salads for me. Cucumber tastes oddly stale to me. Don't know why. Don't think it's COVID because I don't think I've had COVID. Of course, you can't always tell. Now, normally with seedlings like this, you'd, you'd have to be a little bit careful about keeping the leaves dry, but these grow in damp places anyway. So I don't think they're gonna mind too much. I just noticed I've missed one there. I'll put one in, I'll slot one in there in a minute. Right, well, there we go. So, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, eighty plants, hopefully, of wall pennywort, plus whatever survives out of that lot. Also, just to catch up with the upstairs garden here, so we've got the potatoes are all showing nice signs of growth. Lots of potato plants coming up there. The leeks, I think, are still doing okay. Yeah, the leeks have come on a little bit. Most of those have taken, I think. We might have lost one or two. And the broad beans are coming up here. And they're a little bit, well, they'll get tangled up in this netting if I let them. So we're gonna get some, some of these metal hoops in to keep the netting up off the beans. We're also, in the other half of this plot here, we're gonna plant the runner beans. So we're gonna get a structure with some canes up here and then plant a load of runner beans to grow up them. Also in this plot here, planted rhubarb. So we've got, I think this is a variety called Strawberry Surprise. Okay, so a network of canes. And we're planting Scarlet Emperor, which is a really sort of classic variety. Bright scarlet flowers, long straight pods, and we'll plant two or three of them next to each cane. We're just gonna do like three around each cane. I'll just put them there for the moment and then we can push them in in a minute. Okay, so that's our three seeds for each cane. This end cane here, I think I'll just put two next to. So those are going to go just down, just push them in like that. There we go, push them into the soil. Okay, same here. Just push them into about twice their own depth. We won't need to water those, there's more rain forecast in the coming days and the soil is actually quite moist from the last lot of rain. So we don't need to worry too much about watering these. Same thing we did with all the other things actually. Most of the stuff we planted, we haven't needed to water it in because rain was forecast when we were working on it. Right, so, haven't done the middle canes. Uh, we'll start off with that and then... Um... Yeah. Whatever doesn't come up, we've got plenty Yeah, more. we've got some more spares we can fill in. Yeah. In fact, we might even plant a few 
later in the season, once these have grown up and started flowering, you can always plant another second batch in there to sort of run up through to extend the crop. So that's going to be broad beans and runner beans over there. This small plot by the upstairs greenhouse is going to be more beans, but some slightly different ones here. So the beans I'm going to be growing are from the larder here. So I've got some brown peas, which are from the Indian supermarket. And I've also got some somewhere, there are, black eye peas or black eye beans, which are a variety of French bean. So we'll be growing those as well. And these are ones I just bought in the supermarket. Hopefully they're viable, they should be. So the black eyed beans or black eyed peas, they are just a variety of French bean. And so I'll plant, I think four of those around each of these poles. The brown peas are, I think, a variety of what's called yard long beans. So they'll be interesting because that's a different species, I think. So, but again, I'm pretty sure they'll produce, if they do grow at all, they'll produce edible pods or we can wait for them to ripen and eat the beans, but I'll probably eat the pods. The brown peas, they're a bit smaller, but I don't think that will affect the size of the vines they're going to produce. So again, we'll go for four around each pole. Black eyed beans on that side, yard long beans or brown peas or whatever on that side. So we'll see what happens there. Get some fleece on them now to keep the frost off. There's also here at Shrimp Cottage, in between the downstairs garden here and the upstairs garden there, there's this bank and it's quite steep and it's not really usable for anything productive, but this is kind of a remnant of chalk downland. This is actually probably the slope of the original hill that was here before this house was built. And you can see there are loads of lovely spring flowers in here. We've got primroses in amongst the grass. There's a small dog. We've already planted a few other things in here. So we've planted what we've got here. We've got some uh, ragged robin. Would you not? Um, we've planted, I think, wild marjoram along there. I can see a plantain there. I can see more primroses. I can see speedwell down there. There's all sorts of stuff here. There's that's so there's ribwort plantain. There's uh, probably a hawkweed or something like that. One of the dandelion relatives. We're going to grow this little bank here as a kind of mini meadow, and we're going to rake out some of this t this thatch, this uh, uh, build up of dead grass in there which is which is not good for the wildflowers so we're going to rake out the thatch and then what have you got stone okay um yeah sorry we're going to rake out the th thatch and then plant some more wildflowers in here and produce a little kind of habitat for wildlife it's only tiny it's a very small plot but this should be really good to create a little sort of wildflower reserve and the wildflowers that are here anyway will attract pollinators to our vegetable garden, which is just up there. Eva, what have you got in your mouth? So it will be kind of uh, dual purpose. It will serve us and it will also serve nature. So we've also got yarrow here, which is a sort of meadow and grassland plant. Um, yarrow is really useful plant for the forager. If you get a little cut on your hand or a scratch, it's crushing a bit of yarrow and rubbing it in will stop it bleeding. Really good for that sort of thing. It's a, it's a medicinal plant. Actually a medicinal plant that works. Dandelions here and I just spotted a cowslip there. So that's a cowslip related to primroses but a different species in the same family. So we've got cowslips there, and there is actually a couple of cowslips up behind the vegetable patches, which we'll dig up and move down here. So yeah, this is the plan. It's just rake out some of this thatch, which is moss and dead grass. And it will look really ragged after this, but it will do it good. And I'll try to rake round the primulas, because they are pretty. Are you going to make a little nest out of that? I shall have to be a little bit careful here because I was raking away 
And that is a slow worm. Tail end of. Isn't that interesting? Oh, he's in amongst all of the. There we go. Really doesn't want to be picked up, so I won't labour the point. But there we go. Even though that's a slow worm. There we go. He wasn't actually in a burrow. He was just kind of worked into the the top moss here. So I'll just have to go a little bit more carefully than I was so that I don't injure them because they're great things to have in the garden. So slight change of plan then. Because of that little slow worm, it appears that this moss here is a useful habitat for reptiles. So I'm not going to destroy it all. I'm going to thin out some of it and some of it will leave. So some little patches like this I will scrape down to the soil or near the soil and we'll put some seeds in there, some wildflower seeds. Other bits like along here, I'm just going to leave that. We will still treat it the same way so we'll cut that twice a year like a hay meadow and we'll still try and get some wildflowers established in here but I'm not going to rake out all of this thatch. I'm going to leave some of it. For seeds I've got some yellow rattle, St John's wort and in here I've got pig nuts or earth nuts, Conopodium majus umbella fur that has little tuberous roots that are edible so i'm going to try and get that established in the grass here not necessarily to harvest just as a wildflower so st john's wort i've got a feeling these seeds are going to be tiny yep tiny tiny little seeds just scatter them into the grass here in the places where i've raked Yellow rattle, again, I think they're quite small seeds, and I'm not so, not so small this time. So, slightly bigger seeds, and again, I'm just gonna scatter these along here. That's that. And Conopodium majus, so these are pig nuts, earth nuts. Look a lot like parsley seeds, because obviously they are related. And again, I'll just scatter them in here. And all of these seeds are just gonna take their chances here in the wildflower bank. And it might well be that they sit here dormant for years. It might be, might be that this isn't the right place and they never come up, but I'm not gonna try and plant whole plants here. I'm just gonna scatter some wildflower seeds on here and see what happens. And then we've got one more thing I think to plant today, which is gonna be, I've got a packet of Swiss chard. And since the runner beans here are gonna be doing their thing all up the top here, I think we can have a row of Swiss chard along the front here and it'll just grow. It won't affect the beans at all. It might compete a tiny bit for nutrients, but it won't be competing for light because the beans are all doing their thing up here. So I'll put a row of this Swiss chard in. Swiss chard seed pods. Each of these is a little corky sort of pod that contains several seeds. So we don't want to go too... Oops, I'm not really doing it very evenly here, but I can then just i'll just run my hand along the seed drill there which will help to distribute them a little bit as well as bearing them in and there we go just cover those up and again don't need to water those in because it's going to rain that's about everything out here for today so tomatoes are going to be in the upstairs greenhouse there we've got potatoes and leeks we've got two different kinds of culinary beans over there which i i say culinary they're ones that came from the larder broad beans, runner beans and Swiss chard. This plot here is going to be courgettes and pumpkins and then obviously rhubarb there. Rhubarb, this is a really nice deep plot here so this was this was actually almost there was like a big dip in it when we moved in and we just filled it up with well rotted manure and compost and so that's got really deep root run there and that's what rhubarb really likes. That is a tree seedling so that can just come out okay well that's about it for out here today just got one more thing to do indoors so one more thing I've got is my volunteer squash seeds these are the seeds of uh, squash that kind of planted itself in the old garden at the old house <clears throat> and I saved the seeds from that squash so we're going to plant some of them in these pots I've got two in those already uh, so we've got just one in each pot now I couldn't grow these last year because we were moving house and I didn't know whether we were going to move during the summer and miss the whole crop. So these seeds are a year and a bit old. So 
hopefully still viable. So I'm just going to give those a water, cover them up with a bit of plastic, and we'll see if they germinate. This is a little powered turntable that I bought for use in video. It's meant to be for displaying things. And you just put them on there and they go round and round. Which is great, except it's not very good. I don't know if you can see that, it's kind of stuttering as it goes round. It's got a variety of features, like you can change the direction and you can change the speed. But all of the modes have got this kind of stutter. It only happens at certain points of the rotation. You'll see it again in a moment. There it goes. Which makes it kind of useless. Uh, they do say buy cheap, buy twice, which is what I'm going to end up doing because I think this thing is about 10 quid. Uh, so not ideal. It's powered either from a USB power source or three triple A's. Helicopters overhead. Or one 18650 lithium cell. Made in China. I'm going to take it apart to see if I can figure out what's wrong, but I have a feeling I'm going to break it. Because these holes here, you might think, oh yeah, just go in there and there'll be a screw down the bottom. These are not screw holes. There's nothing in the bottom of them. Anyway, we're going to try and take it apart. And I think the only way to do that is to try and prise it off the spindle. I can't see any other way of getting it apart. So this could be messy, but I might be able to see peer inside and see if I can actually figure out what's holding it together. Just a moment, I think it's just a press fit onto the spindle. So I think if I give that a little bit of a... There we go. Not as bad as I thought. Okay. So there's a little... I don't know if that's a geared motor or if that's just a... Yeah, I think that must be a little geared motor there. There's a little controller board that must have something on the back of it for the speed control. Let's open that up. Let's just take that out and have a look. There must be a little microcontroller on there, I think. There's a bit of grease there on the rim of that that seems to go... Okay, so these bits here are little ball bearings and it seems to roll on those bearings, which is a great idea in principle, but in practice it doesn't seem to actually work. Three wires going to the motor here four wires is that a little stepper and yeah we've got probably one or the other of these is a microcontroller a little lens here these are supposed to clip onto my glasses but they're not actually all that useful and i can't find my bigger magnifying glass i still haven't managed to unpack the box that's got that in there there are no markings on the chips that's helpful not yeah Markings are either sanded off. Oh, there's something on there. Oh, yeah, okay. Right, so. HY22C1S ULN2003AG4 on that one. And on this one, NADA. Now I don't think I'm just don't think that's just my eyes. I think this that one is actually blank. But anyway, I think one of these is going to be a stepper controller, the other one is going to be a microcontroller. So that's what's doing that. Let's just see if it still stutters when I run it without the turntable on there. I don't suppose it should because there's really not much resistance to movement when it's like that. So let's have a look. So Hmm. So no, it doesn't seem to stutter. So whatever's going wrong here is really just a case of a little bit too much torque, probably. This, we're asking too much of this motor to have it turn this turntable against all of these bearings. I'm wondering if I just snap that one off and have it running on the outside bearings here, which is, there's an extra one here. So there's five bearings around the outside. And this one on the middle that really kind of almost looks like it doesn't belong. I am going to take a chance here 
and I'm going to cut this one off and I'll see if it runs better with just the five perimeter bearings, which at least are evenly spaced. But I think for now we can put the controller board back in place. I think, we've, I think I've satisfied my curiosity about what's going on there. So the bodgiest of bodges, I'm actually just going to cut that post off there, which I think I can probably just do with wire cutters. Just don't tell anyone you saw me do this and it'll be fine. Okay, and then I think that will just break off. Yeah, good. All right, covered in grease. Let's put it on there for now. Okay, and if I'm right, with the absence of that post, the turntable will run on those five perimeter bearings, which, as long as they're all moving, yeah, they are all mobile. Made a mess of my hands again. There is a little flat in that hole that fits onto that spindle. Now, before we put it back together, I actually think there's quite an interesting source of, of stuff here. For one thing, I think there might be charge control circuitry on this board so that it will, from the USB, charge the 18650 battery that's in there. I think it will. I haven't tested that and the instructions, there, were, <laughs> there weren't any instructions. It turned up in a plastic bag. So uh, with no paperwork or anything like that. So there it is. But a little stepper motor and a controller board that's got variable speed function and reverse function on it could be quite useful in its own right. I mean, as I say, I paid, I think, a tenner for this, which is maybe a bit much for that kind of circuitry. But if you wanted something ready made that has a stepper motor and low speed reverse variable speed on it, could be quite an interesting just way to quickly get that stuff without mucking about with your own microcontroller setup and so on. I don't know if I wanted, for example, to take that motor out of there and make a linear rail system to move a camera, that might be an option. I might still do that if this doesn't fix it. Anyway, let's put that back on and see if it still stutters. A moment of truthiness. Yes, yeah, so it does. And so I think almost certainly what's happening here is the stuttering is something to do with this rim catching. So that should probably come off a lot easier now. Well, you would think so anyway. So, am I imagining it? Am I merely imagining that this stutter is limited to when the platter is on there? Or is it real? piece of tape on the spindle and we'll run it again and see what we get. Well that looks pretty smooth to me. So I think the stutter is caused by the rim of this thing. I think this little lip here is riding on this little lip here. This, that's rough there, for example, and there's probably rough spots on here. This rim shouldn't be touching anything. The, the platter should be running on these bearings. In fact, we can, well, we can try it like this. So that, at the moment, that's just very lightly pressed onto that spindle. It's nothing is touching anything here, so it's not touching the bearings and it's also not touching the rim. Okay. And I'll just balance that on there. Yep, and that is smooth as you like. So nothing is riding on anything else here. So it is just some bit of friction. It's not the motor, it's not the drive itself. Yeah, there's still a little bit of kind of chug there, so I think it might actually be kind of backlash in the gears in this motor. It doesn't feel like very much, but uh, maybe it's the motor that's actually 
not the greatest quality. Ah oh, well, I think it might be just a case of I'll use this for parts and I'll buy myself a slightly better quality turntable. By the way, if you're wondering what this is, it's a tiny fanless x86 PC that goes on the back of a monitor. It's a visa mount computer that has, well, very minimal. It doesn't have any storage at all in it. It's got some RAM. The, it runs directly off an SD card that will go in that slot there. It can be configured with a Linux OS, or I think it will actually just about run a version of Windows. I've got a plan for this, but I haven't got around to doing anything with it yet. But that will come at some future point. So kind of final thoughts on this. I think there's probably just a bit too much play and flexibility in the whole center drive thing of this. I'm not even really sure that this turntable is riding on those bearings. I think it's riding on the rims. The weight is not borne on these bearings, but on the rim of the plastic. I'm going to give up now because I don't really think this device can be redeemed as is. I think probably a turntable would be better off with a rim drive rather than trying to drive from a spindle in the middle because this whole, there's just play and flexibility in that joint there. So if you can imagine something talking that center post there, the flexibility of the plastic means that there's gonna be a little bit of kind of stick slip type of action there. So, so I don't think I'm actually gonna try and redeem this device, but this little stepper motor and the driver board for it, I might do something with it because I maybe can use this motor for a linear drive. Maybe I'll put a, a coupler on there and couple it to a screw thread and have that drive something very slowly along a linear rail. Or maybe I'll just put a, a pulley on there with a belt and drive something that way. It could still be a camera mount, and so we might end up having a camera mount that can move sideways rather than a turntable that can move the subject around and around. And I'm in the market for a new turntable because this is clearly not up to spec. So that's everything for this episode of Random Stuff. I hope you enjoyed that. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you again soon.